Hey there, everybody. Good morning. It is Saturday morning, July the 2nd, 2022, 856 in the morning, and we're in the book of Numbers, chapter number 11. I don't remember how many verses we have here, but it's a very interesting passage, 35 verses there are, and I think you're going to enjoy the read today. We are finally out of all that organization. Not that that's a bad thing. We talked about it while we were there. We need that, and God's work has to be done in an organized fashion. It's a shame to think that the world would take their energies and efforts to organize their work that only benefits themselves, and we as God's people wouldn't specifically organize and design his work or our efforts. Uh, One good man of God I know says this, no form, no filling. You know, when you pour concrete, you have to build a wooden form or a a steel form. So you have to put some kind of form around the area you're going to pour the concrete in because you pour the concrete, it's going to spread until it gets to the edges of the form. And so the only thing you can do, if, if you don't have a form, you're not filling anything. And so God says that he wants to fill us with his spirit and he wants to bless the work of our hands. Well, that work has to be framed up and organized in order for that filling to take place. And so here we are in chapter number 11. Let's just read and we'll get into it today. Father, thank you for the reading and study that we have been doing. Thank you for the introduction to this book. Sometimes our flesh can get a little weary of repetition, and uh, it just teaches us to not pay attention to our flesh, that there is good to be found in these things. Would you help us now as we start looking at the demeanor of your people? May we see things in ourselves that need to be adjusted or corrected, or maybe we'll see some things that we need to maintain and hold the line on. Give us wisdom from what we read today, please. In Christ's name we ask, amen. All right, Numbers chapter 11. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. All right, so... This verse, this first verse, is chock full of some pretty good truth that uh, we need to pay attention to. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. It still does, by the way. When you complain about your life and what's going wrong in it and how things aren't coming together for you, that displeases the Lord. None of us have any reason to complain, and we should seek to not be complainers. Usually, the reason we complain is because things aren't going the way we want them to. And uh, you know what? I'm so sorry. We'll hand you a tissue so you can dry your tears. Things aren't always going to go the way that we want to. And so when we complain, it does displease the Lord. The next phrase says, and the Lord heard it. So when we complain, the Lord hears our complaints and it displeases him. He doesn't want to listen to complaining. Have you ever had your children just whine and complain to you? And eventually you get to the point where you say, you know what, just stop it. I'm not interested in listening to your complaints. Instead of complaining, go do something about the situation. Make your situations better. Oh, this bed is hard. Fine. Go make some money and buy a new bed. Uh, But don't complain. Complaining gets nothing done. It only brings down the spirit uh, of those around you. <clears throat> so the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. Our complaining makes God angry. It displeases him, he hears it, it makes him angry. Don't make God angry. You don't want to see him when he's angry, right? And the fire of the Lord <clears throat> burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So not only was God angry, but he judged the people on the basis of their complaining. You know, we like to say, boy, uh, God ought to really take care of those uh, those abortion doctors. He ought to judge them harshly. Well, don't you worry. God is capable of, of taking care of meeting out justice. But no one ever says, boy, God ought to really take care of those complainers. You know why? Because we find ourselves in that pool. Uh, God is not pleased with complaining. It makes him angry. He hears our complaints and he will punish us and judge us for our complaints. Verse two, and the people cried unto Moses because of all these deaths in the camp. 
And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And so the people come to the Lord or to come Moses and say, will you please do something? Our people are dying. And so Moses goes to the Lord and God quenches the fire. And he called the name of the place Taborah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. All right, so that's the first section of this chapter, three short verses, but it points out pretty clearly that God's not interested in listening to us complain. He's been very, very good to us, and we have no reason to complain. Verse four, and the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Okay, so a mixed multitude. What you have here are some Jews, some non-Jews. Remember the strangers that dwelt amongst them. Guarantee you, when they left Egypt, there were some Egyptians that went along with the Hebrews, and God told them if they were going to convert, they had to uh, be circumcised, observe the Lord's, or not the Lord's Supper, the uh, Passover feast, and so forth. So this mixed multitude, they start to lust, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? So we're at the stage, and we're going to see it in a couple verses, that God's giving the children of Israel manna to eat. Manna was exactly what the people needed while they're in the wilderness. But now they want meat. They're they're lusting after meat. And they say this, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. So basically, just the way they phrase this, remember how amazing it was in Egypt and all we have now is this manna. Well, Egypt was the devil's stronghold and their place of slavery. This manna is a heavenly gift from God. Can we get that cold and indifferent in our hearts to where the blessings of God, the mercy and grace of God, his goodness, his word, the ability to pray to him, the fellowship we have with his people, to where we just go, eh, this manna, versus you know, boy, what the world used to provide for us. So they want flesh. They want meat. Verse six, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof as the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans, and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. Now, that's a good taste. for It's better than stale oil. They loved to use oil in their cooking, and so this is a good dish here. Uh, that I, You know, I, I don't know exactly what manna is. Uh, this coriander seed, the color of delium, you can investigate it, look into some commentaries, even uh, read uh, some things online about it. But it, it, it they could gather it every day. Uh, they only gathered enough each day for that day and no more. If they gathered more, it would they would find it rotten in the morning. On the Sabbath day or the day before the Sabbath, they would gather two days worth and God God would allow it to last two days. And so they cooked it every way they can, right? They ground it in mills, beat it in mortar, baked it in pan, make cakes of it. But it was a good food. And by the way, we're going to see here tomorrow or the next day, God only intended for the children of Israel to be in the wilderness about six weeks, not much longer than that. So this manna wasn't going to last forever, but they can't even get through these six weeks. Verse number 10. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. Doesn't it, it seems interesting. We found it in verse one, displeasure comes, then anger comes. I guess the longer the displeasure lasts, the great, the, the sooner or the more likely the anger comes. So the people, they're, this is really sad, they're even weeping. Oh, why did we leave Egypt? Why did we go? The food was so much better there. Yeah, and you were slaves. The Egyptians treated you terribly. What are you talking about? 
And so God is angry about this. Moses is displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, now, now Moses starts to complain. <laughs> this is all falling apart on the Lord, isn't it? He's just trying to help his people and be good to his people, and everyone's breaking down on him, even Moses. Moses says, wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? God, you've, you've afflicted me. This isn't a blessing to me. This is an affliction. And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me. So God, Moses doesn't view being the leader of Israel as a blessing. He views it as a burden, <laughs> as a, a, uh, a, a judgment against him. And then Moses says, have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. He said, Lord, did I conceive these kids? Did I give birth to them? Because, you know, here it is. Uh, I can't take care of them. I can't get them to the promised land like a, a nursing baby. I can't take care of these people. Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. He says, They're begging me for meat. I don't know where to get it. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And this is true. Uh, you know, I've, I mentioned this the other day. One, a preacher that I know makes this statement. He says, You're either called to be a pastor or to help a pastor. And that is true. No pastor can bear all the burden of the people alone. That's why God gives deacons to the church. That's why he gives trustees to the church. That's why he gives uh, soul winners and servants and helpers to the church. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. And if thou deal thus with thee, this is Moses still praying to the Lord. If you want to continue this, God, is what he's saying, kill me. I pray thee out of thy hand, if I have not, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. He says, God, if you really love me, you'd kill me and take this burden away from me. That's a pretty dark place. Verse 16, so God gives Moses a solution. And by the way, we should look more for solutions than we do at the problem. Stop looking at your problem. It's only discouraging you. It's only depressing you. Look for solutions. And let me say this. The solution isn't for other people to change. The solution is for you to change. The solution isn't for you to make someone else do what you want them to do. The solution is for you to change so that you can adapt to the problem or figure out a way to overcome the problem. Because uh, when you want other people to change, that's just a whole other problem. Uh, see, notice here, God doesn't tell Moses, and we'll see it, He's not going to say, well, fix the heart of the people, because it's not possible, is it? The Lord said unto Moses, verse 16, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them under the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto thy unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh, for ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. So God says, Go find seventy men, Moses of the elders of Israel, bring them to me at the tabernacle. And the same spirit you have, I'm going to give to them. And that's the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. It says, I'll give them the spirit and they will help you bear the burden of the people. And I want you to go tell the people, I've heard their complaints and cries. They're going to have some meat to eat. Verse 19, you shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it become loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? 
God's saying, you want meat? I'm going to give you meat. I'm going to give you meat so much that you're sick of it. It's going to run out your noses. You're going to, you're going to hate meat by the time this is all done. Not one day or two day or five day or 10 day or 20 day, but a whole month. And so he's, and the reason he says this is because you have despised the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Uh, they despised God, the, the one who's helping them, who's being a blessing to them, who's trying to lead them and serve them. They hate him and they wish they were back with their slave masters. And Moses said, the people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? So Moses is trying to figure out what God's going to do. And for the record, we shouldn't always try to figure out what God's going to do. Sometimes he goes in a direction that we can't even think of. And that's what happens here. And the Lord waxed unto Moses. Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Moses, do you think I'm incapable of doing what I just said I would do? Thou shalt see me now, whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Notice God doesn't even tell Moses how he's going to do it. He just says, trust me, you will see. And you know what? That's what we need to do. Just trust, move forward. If God's led you to do something, move forward in that direction and trust him. Verse 24, and Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied and did not cease. So God told Moses, get 70 men to help you. I will give them the spirit of God. And God does that very thing. And now they're helping and leading the people as well. And then there's this anomaly, this unusual situation. Verse 26, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle and they prophesied in the camp. So these were two of the 70 men, but they hadn't made the trick to the tabernacle yet. But God gives them his spirit, and they begin to prophesy. So the people are concerned about this. Verse 27, And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. So, here, uh, this young man runs because this is highly unusual. They're speaking as Moses speaks on behalf of the Lord. And they're, they're concerned. Should these two guys be doing this? And when Aaron hears it, Aaron says, stop them. You need to stop them. They don't need to be uh, prophesying like this. And look at Moses' response. And Moses said unto him, envious thou for my sake? See, Moses is the only one who should be able to do this, not these other people too. Uh, that's like a pastor saying, I'll be the only person to preach to my folks. I'm not bringing anybody else in to preach to them. Uh, I'm not going to allow anybody else uh, in the church to teach Sunday school. I will teach everyone in Sunday school. Well, if you're going to reach a good number of people, you have to delegate teaching and preaching responsibilities to others as the ministry grows. And so Moses tells his brother, don't be envious for my sake. And then he says this, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And by the way, that's the way it is now. We are all prophets and we all have the spirit of God. That's almost like an answer to Moses' prayer there. And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. And here's God feeding the Israelites meat. Verse 31. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea. So a quail is a small bird. Uh, it's a game bird. It's not like a pigeon or just a, a small uh, tweety bird. I don't know what else to call them. Uh, it's a game bird like a, a pheasant or a duck would be. And let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. So they say that a day's journey for the Israelites was about 15 miles. So for a 15-mile diameter circle, all the way around 
the the uh, camp of Israel were quail. And then it says two cubits high. A cubit for us is elbow to the tip of the middle finger. That's about 18 inches, generally speaking, on the average human. So 36 inches, three foot high, 15 miles in every direction, three feet high quail. They're going to eat it for 30 days. <laughs> and the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails he that gathered least gathered 10 homers. So the guy that picked up the fewest quail gathered 10 homers. Now, I don't know what a homer is. I think it's about a bushel basket. So the guy who's the laziest, he only goes out and gets 10 bushel baskets of quail. He uh, that gathered least gathered 10 homers. Verse 33, and look here, boy. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, while they're chewing the meat, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hadava. Oh, I barely pulled that one off. Kibroth Hadava, because there they buried the people that lusted. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Hadava unto Hazaroth and abode at Hazaroth. So could it be that this flesh had some sort of disease in it? I can't imagine. They're eating the meat for a month. You know, we have refrigeration these days, and thank God for it. How are they preserving these quail? <clears throat> Were they getting some sort of uh, salmonella poisoning? And it killed those. And of course, the ones who lusted for it the most are probably the greediest. I'm wondering if this guy with the 10 homers, he may not have eaten any uh, or have been killed or gotten sick. But God judged them for their lust and for their uh, despising of him. All right, that's it. That's Numbers chapter number 11. That's an interesting chapter, isn't it? Where did we start? The complaining of the Lord's people against him, and then Moses' inability to lead the people, so the choosing of the 70 elders to also prophesy, Eldad and Medad prophesying, scaring the people, Moses saying, would to God, all of them did, and then the promise of the quail, the delivery of the quail, the eating of the quail, sickness by way of quail, death by quail. <laughs> So I don't know if that was on their tombstones. These people died from eating quail. All right, that's all I've got for you there. Uh, tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., we'll play chapter number 12 for you recorded. And as always, please like, love, and share the post. Let people know that we're out here. And I will see you tomorrow sometime. Have a wonderful Independence Day weekend. Those of you in the United States of America, enjoy your time of celebration. Be careful out there. And if you're uh, local, still be faithful to your own church. Don't skip church because it's a holiday. And if you're out of town, still go to church somewhere. All right, God bless you. We'll talk to you later.